sometimes, even now, years later, when I'm writing on the board, I remember Turtle and the way he thanked me wasn't as if I expected any kind of a thank you from him, but I had taken his class from the dropout prevention program to the Whitney Museum, and he'd fallen in love with a painting there, Willem de Kooning's Woman with Bicycle. He even bought the poster. That he would buy the poster itself was amazing. He was a 19-year-old kid from East Harlem, and that was his first time at an art museum. And the painting itself was pure abstraction. Well, there were a couple of discernible parts. At the top of the canvas were two bulging eyes, then a big red mouth full of teeth, two enormous breasts pointing in opposite directions, and at the bottom, a pair of delicate feet in black sandals. But all the rest was wild brush stroke in color. I found the painting ugly myself, and it made me wonder whether de Kooning didn't hate women. But there was something very compelling about it because your eye was always searching for that hidden bicycle. If I could compare that painting to a poem, it would be Lewis Carroll's The Jabberwocky, a poem full of wild nonsense, but if you listen closely, a form will take shape. The Jabberwocky. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the bar groves, and the mumraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the mangsome foe he sought, till rested he by a tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes aflame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through his vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. So if you listened carefully, you saw the jabberwocky and it was probably a lot more clear than the bicycle in Willem de Kooning's Woman with Bicycle, which you would really only see if you were there with an arts educator. And we were a lovely lady who really explained the painting so well, convinced us that that slash across the middle of the canvas was the crossbar of the bicycle. And Turtle bought it. <laughs> But I think he was only interested in the breasts. <laughs> because on the last day of his senior year, what he said to me was, Miss, thank you. I really loved watching your ass jiggle when you wrote on the board. <laughs> Our school was located on the Upper East Side in a neighborhood of blue bloods and blue haired old ladies who wore silvery mink coats. Our students were black and Puerto Rican kids from East Harlem who traveled down because there was no school in their neighborhood. Julia Richmond High School. It was an older building in a neighborhood of sleek boutiques, museums, and gourmet food shops. On our way back from the museum, we stopped in at Grace's Marketplace to buy some snacks. We couldn't afford them. But all of the students were awed by the fruit display in much the same way that they had been impressed by the paintings at the Whitney Museum. Turtle was curious about the kiwi fruit and one of the store's employees was good enough to cut one open and show my students what it looked like inside and they were amazed by the green color. Turtle commented on the black oval of seeds. 
Wow. That looks just like my girl's cooch. Sorry, miss. But it even has hair on the outside. Something I'll always remember about Kiwis. Grace's was the local store. So the only place for my students to buy a bag of chips was at the newsstand by the train station. And the only place that they could really call their own was the school building itself. But luck had it that my classes didn't meet in the main building. They met in the annex three blocks away, and it wasn't really an annex at all, but the neighborhood community center. They offered us space for the dropout prevention program during the day. So my students had to share the space with the local ladies who were so stiff and proper in their manner and speech that my kids didn't even realize they spoke the same language. They gawked at the dead animals that these ladies wrapped around themselves and the ladies opened their eyes wide to the language that came out of the mouths of these babes. But we learned to share. That's New York, isn't it? Winston's mother was bequeathed the brownstone and the Hamptons estate. Ma Shorty's mama is a crackhead. I felt sometimes that I was the only one who understood both dialects and became the mediator and translator, commander and master of words between the Upper East Side fancy pants and the Harlem teens. Jose, you can't say get the fuck out of here to those ladies. <laughs> my bad, miss. But my house, when someone says something funny, we say get the fuck out of here. It all came down to words, and I was their English teacher. <laughs> But the things that you would never say to your teacher, my students said to me. <laughs> One time when I turned from the board with a question, a girl raised her hand. Ooh, ooh, me, me. And I called on her. Oh, miss, we all can see your panty line. <laughs> Caused a momentary problem. Maybe the rest of the semester I couldn't turn around and write on the board, but I eventually got over it. But that was a line of iambic pentameter. That was the first thing that I heard before the words set in. That basic rhythm, as primitive as your heartbeat. I mean, sometimes the words don't even matter until they do. Oh, miss. We all can see your panty line. <laughs> My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. <laughs> Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I've seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. Sonnet 130. But that year, in the dropout prevention program, I heard things that shocked me, but nothing more than the five words I heard from Vinny. He was another kid in the dropout prevention program. It was a half day program. At the end of the day, I'd walk the students back over to the main building, which was where the cafeteria was, and they took lunch together. As we walked, conversations would go something like this. Yo, Gino, I hear you do an Eleanor and a fat sister, too. <laughs> no, man, I'm just doing the fat sister. <laughs> Boy, 
I caught some excellent weed from that new gym teacher, Mr. G. <laughs> Let's light it up right after lunch. I thought it best not to get involved with those conversations, so I spoke to Vinny. He was a little more mature, a little more focused than the other kids. He liked to talk about the obstacles in his life, mostly his mother, who was a crackhead, and his goals to graduate from high school by the time he was 21 and become a cop. <laughs> I'd leave them all at the corner and let them go into the building themselves, and then I'd sneak into the park and smoke a cigarette. But one day, Vinny didn't go in with the others. He lingered behind. I really wanted that cigarette. I would not smoke it in front of him. I figured he just needed a little more attention that day. And I really thought I knew him. I taught him for almost a year, listened to him, advised him. But I was not ready for what he had to say. Miss. I want to sex you. <laughs> I don't think he thought he said anything wrong. And I'm pretty certain he was really speaking from the heart. But I was taken unaware. Which reminds me of a poem. <laughs> the Shirt by Jane Kenyon. <coughs> The shirt touches his neck. It smooths down his back. It slides down his sides. It even goes down below his belt, down into his pants. Lucky shirt. <laughs> I've recited all types of poetry to them, from the archaic English and iambic pentameter of Shakespeare's sonnets to the nonsense words of the Jabberwocky. But they always come back at me with their own rendition of the shirt. Their idea of a role model and how to speak to one and when to say what they say defies my own definition. But I know that what they say is not meant to, meant to shock me, but is meant to make me wonder and to make me realize that there's still so much unexpected in this world. Thank you. Whoa.